Today's episode of Brunch is brought to you by DraftKings. The NFL is here, and DraftKings Sportsbook, official betting partner of the NFL, is giving you a can't-miss offer. $200 in bonus bets instantly when you bet 5 bucks on any NFL game. Uh, Draft Cook, DraftKings is hooking everyone up with game day greatness. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every single game day. Uh, download and use the promo code WASH to sign up. New customers can take home $200 in bonus bets instantly just for betting 5 bucks. That's code WASHED only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. The crown is yours. Brunch! Hit it, boys! <laughs> We got our first mini episode. We're back-ish, kind of. How long has it been since we did a real episode? Like a week and a half? Yeah, two like weeks? two weeks, I think. Yeah. That's weird. It, we were planning on doing one, uh, just to peel back the curtain a little bit. We were planning on doing one last weekend. We were going to do the Eras Tour. I saw the Eras Tour in theater theaters. Um, you were going to, and then you got a flat tire. Yeah, it popped a tire, and I Likely story. told my therapist about this, and she... Knowing my general, she could guess that I probably wasn't head over heels to see that film said, kind of like when your salad blew away. And I was <laughs> like, you are the you are the coolest therapist in the world. Did you ever tell the story of the salad on the podcast? If I didn't, you've told real me quick, 9,000 times in personal life. Just because it's your favorite story. It is. You like it is want the, it's you hilarious. Bring, you get the story. You take the story. I don't give you the story. We walked by the scene of the crime uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And as soon as we were walking by uh, Sweet Green and you go... Hey, I got a cool story for you. I knew exactly what you were about to say. I said, like, you know what happened here? And <laughs> yeah. you said the salad blew away. <laughs> yeah. uh, th- in 20 seconds, I was at Sweet Green sitting outside. My salad blew away, and I was very happy about it, even though I'd sp- we have spoken about it on the podcast because you said it combines your f- two favorite things. Wasting money. Wasting money and, and eating like, like shit. Eating horribly, <laughs> yeah. which, guilty. Uh <laughs> This is a Killers of the Flower Moon episode. Uh, we were unable to do uh the eras tour one for that reason i will say quickly on the eras tour yeah i had a great time i'm glad that it exists like i was expecting a little bit more um behind the scenes stuff for some reason Mm. like i don't know i I kind of was envisioning in my head like a long pond sessions type deal where it's like more documentary like a little bit inter inter intertwined between like the performances and stuff um but i had a great time i'm really glad that it exists and like what a party Mm -hmm. and my theater experience was everything that i wanted it to be people were like quiet nobody was like singing uh everybody was very respectful i sat next to uh like i want to say like a six or seven year old girl and she just chimed in with like a little bit of commentary every now and then and it was adorable she was like I like this. She's like, She's like I, I, I haven't we her. heard some of these songs already? <laughs> she was this like, a I, different one than. She was like, folklore is. It, she's not taking enough chances with this. Yeah, she's. Oh my god, what <laughs> a like, what, DJ will love. What this a girl. safe <laughs> performance this is. <laughs> I did listen to the live version of uh, Cruel, "Cruel Summer." Summer. Yeah. that was put out on Spotify. Uh, tons of pitch correction, but I actually thought that it was pretty authentic in not making it sound like she was doing too many things that she wasn't doing. The only things that they really did was fix her uh, vocal performance, but I thought that there would be like a lot more comping and stuff, but the parts like the the run in the chorus, the ooh, ooh part, uh it they they don't fake it sounding like she's doing it. That's clearly a track and I liked that it was it didn't bullshit a bullshitter mm-hmm. any more than, again, like tweaking some things to make it sound as good as possible. I'm I do will- love that we're starting out the uh, the new brunch experiment where we're like, okay, we're only focusing on one topic. And this episode Sorry is Taylor clearly Swift. titled Colors of the Flower Moon and a little bit of Taylor Swift. But we, we promised you that it wasn't going to be a one track thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Because, Pete, the thing is, Killers of the Flower Moon from director Martin Scorsese is a Western crime drama based on the nonfiction book of the same name. The film follows the suspicious murders of wealthy indigenous people in Osage County, Oklahoma in the 1920s after oil is found beneath their land. I was uh, sent down from Washington, D.C. to see about these murders. See what about them? See who's doing it. Leonardo DiCaprio 
and Robert De Niro lead a resplendent cl- cast. What the hell? Lead a resplendent. You don't know that word? No. Never like heard it in my life. Rich and okay. just like bursting. Can agree. Uh, also, Lily, what's my? Gladstone. Lily Gladstone. How about this? Leonardo DiCaprio, Lily Gladstone, and Robert De Niro lead a positively resplendent cast. As of this recording, the film has a 92 on Rotten Tomatoes. Killers of the Flower Moon carries a runtime of 3 hours and 26 minutes. We'll talk about the length, I'm sure, because everyone's got something to say about it. The main thing I want to say about this movie, bounce back Scorsese. I hated The Irishman. I loved this movie. Oh, this movie was awesome. I didn't hate The Irishman. I thought The Irishman was disappointing. I uh, have not gone back to watch it, and I don't think that I don't ever will. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it's it's about exactly the same time uh, as Killers of the Flower Moon, and it is it an awesome example of how three hours and like three and a half hours can be used appropriately, and how it can be used not so appropriately. the 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 Irishman. I feel like both of those movies felt very long but i walked away from killers of the flower moon being like that was worth the three and a half hours the irishman not so much yeah let's just get into the length thing i reject the it didn't need to be that long thing because it didn't need to be anything it's a movie it's Mm -hmm. an art it's something it's a piece of art that an artist made through their lens the way that they saw fit and yes obviously there is uh there, there is a skill of editing and if you, you it is possible to edit poorly, but this movie being three hours and 26 minutes, I think was a choice and a correct choice because this is a very queasy movie. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it would be as queasy feeling. I'm just going to keep using that word if they tightened it up and did half hour setting it up half hour. Hello, FBI half hour. Here's what ends up happening. That's a good point. Like I, I, um, I always go back to what our friends at Lights Camera podcast said at some point where uh the belief is movies should be as exactly as long as they need to be Mm -hmm. and in a lot of cases like that's why i don't like outright complain at a three and a half hour movie i'll see it first and then complain but i mean you make a good point in that like this is a it's a tough watch yeah it's a tough three and a half hours not because the movie is bad but because the subject matter is uncomfortable and it's a lot of like this same stuff over and over and over again but like in a way that it's supposed to be gut punch after gut punch after gut punch and it's supposed to send a message that like yeah you're not supposed to be comfortable and you're not really supposed to enjoy the three and a half hours here whereas three hours and 29 minutes of the irishman is the quality isn't there like the the whatever the movie equivalent of like song power isn't really there so uh th- stretching that out super long is like not every I'm, part I'm of getting... that story needed to be told right whereas this i you could do the it could have been shorter thing it would have been different and in my opinion worse i love the pace of it i love how stubborn the pace of it is but to your point you're kind of wanting it as you're watching it to break out And I talked to some critics after the screening I attended and they were like, and that hated it. And they were like, you're just waiting for it it to get going. And it never did. And I was like, that's why I thought it was awesome. And like, what do you, for my purposes, it did get going. Yeah. I was going to say like, what it, I don't understand to the back of the head a million times. I don't understand how you can like come away with a take. It never got going. It was going the entire time. Yeah. I mean, so I, I can kind of fall into that camp because you get like two and a half hours in and you still feel like there's a lot like a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Um, But like the it wasn't like it stalled anywhere and it wasn't like I was ever bored. You just like I think that you're just sitting with it for a long time and you're like, well, there's clearly a lot more to go. And that can be a little intimidating or maybe uncomfortable in the watching process. But, like, I didn't come away with it being, like, that That was bad at any point. I thought that Leo was fantastic. I thought that Robert De Niro was fantastic. Lily Gladstone. Scott Shepard as uh, Ernest's brother. Mm-hmm. I thought it was great casting. I thought the casting in this movie was fantastic. I complained on Twitter that you can't have both Jason Isbell and Sergio Simpson in your movie. Got to pick one of those guys. You added to that. My man Marty went 
in on those musical cameos. Yeah. He was, I don't know, I don't know what kind of influence, if it's like a him thing or if it's somebody in his ear being like, yo, you should you should try out this musician. Famously, Action Bronson was that's in, true, right? Was it Selling Action Bronson? Yeah, in The Irishman. Yeah, uh, but by and large, I loved the casting. Brendan Fraser in something of a bit role. Jesse Plemons. We'll talk about the FBI in a second. Uh, the one that caused my text to you of "Do not look up the cast of this movie" was not the musicians. Was not Brendan Fraser. It was friend of the podcast, Pat Healy, mm -hmm. Jeffy. Yeah, I know. It was it was great. As I live and breathe, mm -hmm. and he was fantastic. Yeah, he was. He was Dropped great. Dropped him a DM after. Said, "Hey, just saw your new picture. Thought you were terrific. Hell yeah, Thought you were resplendent." <laughs> um, I, I didn't love all the cameos. I'll say, like, uh, by the time we got to uh, Jack White at the very end of the movie. I, I like legitimately wanted to exclaim in the theater. Oh, come on. There were groans in my theater. Really? There were, yeah. they were like, there, it was a mix of like, <laughs> and <laughs> like, <sighs> yeah, I wanted to, I like, I probably rolled my eyes. Um, and then another one that got me like Brendan Fraser was good, but his arrival on screen is like laugh out loud. Funny. A like, bit much. It is. He, it is an exclamation point. Hmm. As in, like, the case of, like, we got Brendan Fraser. Here he is. And, like, it, it legitimately made me laugh. Something that I learned from this movie. I learned a ton from this movie, obviously. I'm correct in saying that neither of us are readers of The Flower Moon. I am a buyer of The Killers of the Flyer, Flower Moon. And I think I read, like, three chapters. Oh. A classic Pete Blackburn book experience. I was told to read it before I saw the movie. And you can't tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do it. Uh, yeah, I only read The Queen's Gambit. Right. The big uh, thing that readers asked me about after I saw it was uh, how gotcha. heavy was the FBI presence? And I said, there's supposed to be an FBI presence because it was a means to an end. Jesse Plemons is great. As I said, Pat Healy was great. The federal agents did their job in the movie, but that was really it. It mm -hmm. wasn't as much about the formation of the FBI. Not at all. Right, like and like literally not about the formation of yeah, the FBI. Yeah. So I, that was really surprising to me because one I knew that it was like a huge angle in the book like uh, that these murders were a, played a huge role in the formation of the FBI um and like its establishment in the early days um but also when the movie was announced I want to say that Jesse Plemons was announced as the first lead. Whoa. And either that or it was, or it was like Leonardo DiCaprio and Jesse Plemons to co-star in Killers of the Flower Moon. And I'll tell you what Jesse Plemons did not do in this movie. He did not co-star, even though he got the trailers. I was going to say, the trailer suggests, uh, right up until you see the movie, you assume that it's yeah. Leo X Plem. Yeah, so I wonder what sort of um, tweaks and uh, um, like uh, executive decisions were made towards the script uh, when when sort of translating the source material. Because I'm willing to bet that Jesse Plemons probably had a much bigger role in the inception of of the movie, but he doesn't show up until like two hour, two and a half hours, three right. hours into into the movie and doesn't play that large of a role. That is a great thought. Like where in the adaptation process do you decide or maybe you don't decide. Maybe like the script speaks to you and you're like, you know what? At this point, we would kind of be forcing the F like we're so heavily invested in the story of the Osage people. Mm -hmm. And like I loved that they like I gave... like that it's an Osage movie and not an FBI movie. Right. Like they cuz like th there are those. And obviously like there aren't formation of the FBI movies, but not to say like that's another story for another time. It would be like whitewashing the story. Right. I like right. Like this is how like these badass <laughs> yeah. guys came along and I liked that they really like invested in the characters that were going down, mm -hmm. the drunk, the yeah. melancholy. I did not know that melancholy could be used as a noun. Probably going to begin using yeah. it. That was right. Yeah, they say like he's that guy's a. He's no, they, the... they say he's a melancholy. Oh, okay. They like they when he dies via a gunshot to the back of the head. They're they're like, well, he 
you know, he was a bit of a melancholy. Nobody has ever chunked a murder for hire as bad as the guy who was supposed to kill, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, Johnny? The melancholy? Yeah, the uh, melancholy. The, the, I mean, they chunk a lot of their they're not exactly doings. a tidy outfit uh, they are kind of the they're the antithesis of the john mulaney bit about golden joe and the suggins gang mm, where I don't know that one. he has a bit about back in the day all you had to do to get away with a crime was not be there yeah. when people found out about it yeah and like he said like people would take credit for it and they'd be like and if anybody asks tell them it was golden joe and the suggins gang and then they would shoot suggins into the wall and run away and that would just be it and then they'd be like detective there's a pool of blood in the back gross clean it up <laughs> uh so this Henry's. is the opposite of it because yeah. they found ways to fuck up things that I would assume you're just routinely getting away with back oh, then. Oh yeah, like 100%. we want this guy Especially gone. When you have political influence, just ask. Like I bet that's that's where that came from. Like nowadays, if you hire a hitman, there's the paper trail and it comes back to you or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say like they have the same odds of getting caught if they do it themselves. But back then, the idea of hiring someone to do your business for you did make a lot of sense. How are you going to get from it's it's so unlikely they're going to find the person who did it, it's, let alone someone who asked them to do it. I know. And especially like when you have money and somebody's desperate and they're like, I'll give you a thousand dollars. Just go kill this guy. You're That's not going to get caught. Some of those deals were were kind of tough. Yeah, it was sad. The, the price of uh, a life to those people. Uh, yeah. And I mean, so I, I agree with you. I'm glad that like um, if something had to get left out from the source material, like I'm glad that it was the FBI stuff. But my my tweet after I got out of the movie theater was like, great movie, strong performances, loved it, would have preferred it to be a miniseries because, like, again, like it is a tough watch in one sitting, three and a half hours, not because of the quality of the movie, but because of the uh, the subject matter, would have liked to see that like spread out maybe over like eight episodes and you can get more into each character and you can definitely tap more into the FBI angle, which I, I, is, I think like interesting. And if you're again, like if you're going to do a movie on it, I'm glad that they focused on the Osage and not the FBI. But like, that was my, my like thought. I was like, man, this would have been an incredible mini series because I left the theater being like the movie felt a little too long but I still wanted more, which yeah. is a really weird feeling to come away with, especially when you really like the movie. I mean, that's how I feel every time I finish Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm like, this was a long movie? Shut up. Give me more. <laughs> uh, I think it's a great thought. I didn't have it, uh, but I agreed when you told me that make it a miniseries. You could uh, you could kind of extrapolate and spread out um, the relationship between uh, Ernest and what's his bride's name? Um, Lily Gladstone's character. Molly. Molly. Because uh, that character was great. She was amazing. Molly she was, was going to get nominated yeah. for stuff. Should. Um, but you could have done a little more on like the courting process, which was interesting because a big part of this movie is uh, that this guy, Ernest, who's very much in on it and is even in on it to the point where he's poisoning his wife, loves this person mm -hmm. and is like, yeah, but like... So, we don't want my wife to die like get into that love then yeah i mean I, I um that was one of my favorite parts of the movie is just like the complexity of the characters it's not it's very much not like a all evil all well i mean i guess for some characters yeah, but Nero. Uh, yeah um but like you know with Ernest's character he just has no fucking spine like I, I truly do believe that he like had legitimate feelings for molly and uh did did care about her but just like a highly impressionable person who has no fucking spine and just does whatever uh, a, a person of influence in his life tells him to do where do you think the scene at the station falls i think it's definitely on the rushmore but where do you feel it falls in the leonardo dicaprio inebriated scene realm uh the scene at the station like the one stand where they make him stand yes uh very very high that's um, like two maybe three 
It's. I mean, there's. You got to have the Wolf of Wall Wolf Street. Wolf of Wall Street is well come to mind first. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a completely drunk uh, Rick Dalton began began making <laughs> yes. margaritas. Yes. Uh, I th- so I think that drunk Dalton, even though he's drunk the whole movie, mm-hmm. but that's thing. Like Wolf, uh, obviously Wolf of Wall Street has several scenes that could uh, be in contention. But you're right. The drive back from uh, the golf course or to the golf course whatever yeah the drive back from the uh, country club but uh once upon a time in hollywood has like three of those scenes too when he's True. supposed to be uh when he's hung over trying to prepare for his scene yep <laughs> and he's like i mean yeah, the- six margaritas stupid he's like beating himself up yeah uh yeah number one for me though is probably just because of the the narration was so good the like at 8 p.m a completely drunk rick dalton uh but his scene when he's getting questioned and he's just pissed drunk was fantastic he he plays a drunk extremely well uh i mean great performance in this movie all around from from him doesn't look great some of it's by design uh some of it i think is maybe leo time it's Leo losing his fastball a little bit, oh. um, but who does look great and who has, you said bounce back Scorsese. It is for sure bounce back Scorsese, but I think like to an even stronger degree, it's bounce back De Niro because De Niro hasn't been impressive in anything in, in a little bit. I think and you said, did you say that recently? Did you point that out? Yeah. Like he's, his batting, av- his batting average is not great. Uh, recently, and he just seems to be mailing in a lot of things that he's doing, including the Irishman, don't, I would I was say. Gonna, don't say Dirty Grandpa. No. <laughs> we will disagree on this. He um, was really good. He was he was awesome in this movie. I think the strongest I performance in this movie is Robert De Niro. Whoa. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's one of three people. Yeah. I mean, Lily one Gladstone is great. Yeah. I think Robert De Niro was amazing in this movie. And it, I, I think like my leader in the clubhouse for best supporting actor. Yeah, not to say that Lily Gladstone's job is easier, but her job is a little more defined, which is just like Stoic. carry the burden of the of all this shit. Yeah, like, like wear it on shit, your face. All this shit fu- is you're just gonna be fucking dumped on you. Mm-hmm. And if you can get through three hours and twenty six minutes worth of film without your knees buckling. It's a very t- tall task, but it's at least like an outlined task. And, and Whereas Leo's character is a awful person, as you said, spineless, mm-hmm. who's in love and is kind of playing two different characters. De Niro is in his kind of De Niro boss bag. Like it's it's a so it's not like it's not a cartoonization of of that character who is. Like you can easily have a cartoony uh, William Hale, mm. King Hale, because that dude is fucking straight up evil, and uh, but he he can't present himself that way because he can't have any power. Like, in, if you're telling a a true realistic story of this dude's life, he can't just be like an outright evil person because people, people would, would see, see through, through it. it. Yeah. yeah, he needs to be a conniving, manipulative guy, and I think that De Niro does an awesome job of portraying that. And and like at points makes you question in the movie, you'd be like, ah, huh, like wh- where's this guy coming from? Is he as evil as like some some things would suggest? I think it's just an awesome performance, an awesome writing job of that character. The screenplay in this movie is just like a ten thousand out of ten. Oh yeah, and yeah, like the some of the lines De Niro's scene. I'm thinking specifically after. Uh, the death of was it Rita? Where they all huddle up and they're like, "Yo!" Like the whole town is like, "What is yes, going yeah, on yeah, here?" Yeah, yeah. And he's pledging his uh, support to the cause and all that stuff. Like that. That if there's like a fifteen minute Robert De Niro highlight reel, that could go in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's got lots of minutes. I, I mean, I think that this is uh, this one is going to be heavily, heavily featured uh, in Oscar season, mm-hmm. no doubt. I think right now, like I think that the it's going pound for pound with uh, with Oppenheimer as like Oscars favorites. 
I uh, I want is Oppenheimer um an original screenplay or is it an adapted screenplay? Uh, it has to. I don't think it's based on. Let's see, Oppen. I don't think that it's based on. Um, written and di- written and directed by Christopher Nolan. Uh, but is stars. it based off of like a biography or something? Oh, uh, it is. It's based on American Prometheus by okay. Kai Bird. So that'll be an adapted screenplay. So both of these, I'm going to have a, a, I can I can tell I'm going to have a real tough time uh, deciding where I'm going to lean and go with uh, for best, uh, best adapted screenplay. Yeah, I think that, uh, I'm trying to think. Barbie probably gets nominated for best picture, which is absurd. Uh, but... Like I don't, I I've get I've been getting less and less. Bo is afraid, buzz and talk in the like after when Bo is afraid came out. Still haven't seen it. Everybody was like, Bo is afraid, crazy. A twenty four, it's f- fucking Joaquin Phoenix, crazy. Uh, and I saw it. I was like, that's some crazy shit. I get a similar that's crazy feeling that I got from uh, everything everywhere all at once. Except everything everywhere all at once gave me like. This is the best movie kind mm-hmm. of vibes. Bo is afraid. I feel like I think I kind of understand why maybe some of that buzz has died down. But yeah, like Oppenheimer is going to be there. This for sure is going to be there. It was going to be there whether it was good or bad. The Irishman got nominated for Best Picture. Let's not forget. <laughs> this so, has been a good year for movies, though. I'll say that. Yeah, I uh, and we'll see. It'll, man, it will be interesting. Best director this year because you're going to have Nolan against Gerwig against uh scorsese yeah what else good even? god yeah that's whoever like the other two people who are nominated for that like shout out you guys <laughs> yeah shout out shout out your bludgeoning <laughs> shout out y'all you get to say that uh it's like in sports you still get to put like the i played in that series patch on it's, the jersey. it's like when uh it's like mac jones getting to say that he is a pro bowler exactly so uh We've kind of ran through everything that we like and dislike, which is very minimal about this movie. Where do you go on Letterboxd? I uh, I am right now, I haven't officially logged it, but I, right now I'm leaning four and a half. You know what? Let me grab this because big news. Uh, I did my first Letterboxd review. Oh. And it was of this movie. Wait, really? Yeah. That was your first, first one? Yes. Okay. Let's see what it was. Though its stubborn pace will surely turn stomachs, it's not hard to be floored by everything you see and hear in a return to form for Scorsese. I'll pick up on that after. Uh, The performances are excellent from top to bottom, and Robbie Robertson leaves behind one of the great swan songs with his impeccable score. We forgot to say, Robbie Robertson's score, amazing. It Uh, is. Four and a half stars. Okay, four and a half. Four and a half from the boys. It's I, I I leave room. Uh, sometimes we leave room for it to go up or down. This one is certainly not going down. Like four and a half is the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe bumped up to a five at some point. I don't know when the next time I'm going to watch this movie is. Uh, I want to see it again as soon as possible. We should start calling it if we love a movie and give it uh, four or four and a half stars. We should say we're leaving room for sugar, Ooh. meaning like we can get a little sweeter on it. Over time, like, but it's not going to get worse. You you watch Succession, right? Yes. Remember Boar on the Floor? Yeah. When, when a movie is like four on great, the floor, four means, on the floor means that is, it goes no no further below a four on Letterbox. Uh, four on the floor is also a, a musical drum term. beat. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of people like the Lumineers will be like. <laughs> And that is Killers of the Flower Moon.